So welcome everybody, my name is Reed, I'm with NYSIS Corporation, and I'm here to talk about pesticides, families, and resistance. So what is resistance? Um, this, this is gonna be a, one of the major discussion topics because you actually come across it a lot of times. You look at it at a different light. For you, it's probably, I, I say it's a callback as resistance, but we'll, talk, we'll get about that a little bit later. Um, but generally speaking, every time that you work with some sort of insect family, you're dealing with a particular mode of action. And because of that mode of action, it's, it, it reacts differently with the insect pest, okay? So for example, a synthetic pyrethroid is different than a pyrazole, which would be, let's say, like fipronil. Uh, and the characteristics of resistance, that is that the insecticide chemistry and the formulations can kind of tweak how resistance works, and these are in indicative, i say, uh, points based on the type of family that you're gonna choose to use, all right? So you, in our industry, about five families maybe that we use. Uh, there's about 15 or 16, but for the professional pest side of things, it's around five that we use. Now, IPM, in terms of integrated pest management, does it exist in our industry? I say it does, and it's based on your use patterns of what insecticide that you're trying to use to control a particular pest, right? Now you have directions for use on all these labels that, we, that you read and that you have to use, but that being said, you're probably gonna have a different spray pattern or, or a different, um, use a different piece of equipment based on the particular chemical that you're trying to, trying to use to control the pest. And so other than that, you also have um, help with resources. That is that there's things that you, there's, there's a, which I'll show in a minute, there's resources that you can actually look up and read and it can help you with a particular pest that you're trying to control, okay? And we'll get to that a little bit later. So that being said, um, what I'm here to do is to show you the resources and try to help you succeed, all right? And uh, discussing insecticide families can get kind of cumbersome, but I'm trying to tweak it to where you understand exactly what you're using and why you're using it and why that particular product is in a family. You probably have three or four different products that are probably within the same family. You wouldn't realize that, but you probably do on your, on your trucks or, what, where, or whatever you're allowed to use in your company. Now, why would you change a product that is at you have product A, and for some reason you decide to use product B, aside from boredom or aside from the fact that maybe you, you, you wanna try something different just out of curiosity, why, why do you change for, to, from one product to a different product? And I would say most likely it's better efficacy, right? You think that either the product you're going to use in the future will by chance do better, perform better than the one you're using now at currently. And of course, on the flip side, you would say that the one that you're using currently is not working. And we'll, I'll kind of address this right now that uh, most products that you have on your truck, I would say all of them actually, do work. And that when you have a less efficacy than normal, Maybe it's got nothing to do with the product, but it sometimes it could, be, it could be related to how you apply the product or when you apply the product. So better efficacy. Efficacy is something that you're striving for, and so when you change to a different product, you're assuming that product's gonna have better efficacy, but it might not. And the product you're, you're switching out, you're under the assumption that it's not working properly. Well, I'm gonna try to change your thought process and then kind of have you look at it at a different light, so to speak, okay? But if you think about it, better efficacy equals less resistance, which also equals less callbacks, okay? So you think about that in terms of, hey, the more efficacious a product is or you are at your job, the less resistance that is, the insect population, and therefore less callbacks, okay? But what is resistance? Now, this is very important to understand because this is, this is directly related to the type of insecticides that you decide to use. That it's a heritable, it's a, um, heritable change in the sensitivity of, an in, sensitivity of an insect pest. That is that as you keep on applying the insecticide, you have what's called re repeated failure. And you use more or you apply it more often to try to get the same level of control that you had before. You think about this. Why would an insect side all of a sudden sort of not work? Well, it has to do with you as well. So it's not just the product you're using, but by chance maybe when you're in the month of October or November, you might need to apply that product differently than say January or February or June and July, okay? So repeated failure, obviously, equals less callbacks. 
or excuse me, equals more callbacks and of course less revenue, right? But repeated failure over and over and over again is in, in some ways resistance, all right, to the product that you're using. So what is the equation? I like to say that the probability of resistance, that is Y, all right, it, or, or, or the probability of a callback is based on the change of X, that is that it's the pest species, the number of failures that you have in terms of applying that product, and the product used, that is what particular insecticide are you using, and then maybe that protocol as well. So all those variables kind of come into play with regards to the potential for resistance and the potential for a callback, okay? But there's assumption. The assumption is that you think that yourself, the application technique is perfect and that your process is perfect and flawless. But I can tell you right now that's probably not the case. Most likely there's some sort of mistake, we all make mistakes, and there's some sort of mistake that you're, that, or you have to tweak it differently based on the environmental situation, maybe it's the, the landscape, month of the year, time of the day, something that might need to change your process based on those uh, circumstances, okay? So when you think of traditional IPM, it's mostly agriculture, that is that you'd have sort of uh, the reduction in resistance and the tactics that you would use and so forth to, to, to control the pest population were, or, multi, or a lot and that you would have a certain threshold and, a thre and an injury level that you would actually measure based on the fact of when you would have to switch from one product to the next, okay? However, for our industry, what is the threshold for a homeowner? And my thinking is say it's zip, right? We probably all agree that it's, there's, there's really no threshold. Regardless if you had killed all the roaches and the homeowner finds one American cockroach on its backside and is dead, they're gonna probably call you and say, I still have roaches, even though that insect is dead, right? Uh, but this does this preclude you from actually developing an IPM program, and, and regardless if it's a residential account or a commercial account, and of course it does not. That is that the more, the, the better the process, the less likely of a callback, okay? And the less likely of change of a product that you might have to use. Make it simplifies it for yourself, actually. So if you don't incorporate IPM tactics, then you kind of come across as sort of like a um, chaotic in the thinking process, right? Sloppy writing and sloppy thinking. And therefore, I, as somebody that comes on board and, and also puts a bid out to a potential customer, I can actually potentially steal that business away from you, all right? But if you do incorporate sort of an IPM program where you have a lot of um, detailed, information that potentially you can give to your co potential customer, then you by chance can keep the business or, um, or actually acquire new business, all right? So you increase with, with greater organization, I say you always have the potential to increase the customer retention and then increase your customer acquisition as well, all right? So when we talk about insecticides now and, and the amount of insecticides in the different families, Think about the number one insect pest first, malaria mosquito, okay? Now, how many insecticide families have been used to control this pest? It's a gargantuan amount. If you think about it, <clears throat> this is an old, old 1940s in Los Angeles as, we, as they fog with some sort of methyl bromide uh, in, their, in the early days before they really knew how dangerous this, this is probably DDT actually. And of course, in, in the, the, the soldiers in the war would actually be dusted with DDT on their bodies. Uh, for well, other uh, insect pests too, um, lice, ticks, okay? But if you think about this, this is sort of a, let's just spray everything, let's just do everything with DDT, and we're just not knowing the consequence of, of, of using this particular product or this particular chemistry in the fashion that it's being applied. What happens is that you eventually get resistance, you get callbacks, right? So think about this. <clears throat> All these different application methods obviously cause some sort of resistance in the malaria mosquito and therefore now we don't use DDT and there's other ways of trying to control the insect pest, but it's still an ongoing problem. What can you do as a uh, PMP to understand better the insect population that you're trying to control to, redu to reduce the probability of resistance? The insect is not just some sort of random animal that doesn't have any defense mechanisms. They do have defense mechanisms. And for you, you should understand that they have physical barriers, there's a chemical defense, they actually have 
they actually have uh, cells in their body that actually work like white blood cells, but they're different, but they actually work like white blood cells. And then behaviors, that is that if you're using product A and the insect switches its behavior based on that particular product's chemistry, i.e. the family that it's in, and your process, then you're going to have a, a chance of resistance. You're going you're, you're gonna to have a, a failure, okay? So it's also mating rituals and social interactions and things like that. Think about ants, large super colony ants where you have to use a lot of scatter bait to control the biggest, you know, massive pest population as compared to a particular strategic application for a small little nest of, say, um, yellow jackets, all right? And then, which leads to the, ap the, uh, the application technique, okay? So timing, the timing for the liquid application, the timing of the bait, and that in family all is related to each other with regards to the formulation, okay? So what would you use on, say, a very porous surface? Would you use a wettable powder or would you use say, uh, uh, suspended concentration. Many people would use wettable powders. And a lot of times those are actually, even though not used as much, it can be beneficial but for that particular surface, okay? So DDT, DDT is kind of sprayed with pest population. You have sort of this resistance. And then these guys, this male and female, have a happy day and they mate and they have new babies, right? So this process is repeated over and over and over again, okay, using the same using the same chemical. Now, let's talk about what the insect has and what, 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 it, what it has in its defense mechanisms to prevent your application and your chemist, the chemistry that you're trying to use to, to kill it. So, insects have all this, and I, wanna make, I don't wanna be too, don't wanna actually be too, uh, too in depth, but they have what's called an epicuticle and then a procuticle, and this is kind of like all the heart, if you think of a cockroach or a caterpillar, that's gonna be a cockroach or a, um, grasshopper, really thick and really hard. This is all of this, okay? And then this right here in the basement membrane. So all of this actually is kind of like the, the hard stuff that you touch with your hands. And then you have the internal part, which is where all the, their hemolymph is, their blood. So your, your chemical might have to penetrate all of this through the spiracles and, hair, and, and, and the hair follicle uh, openings to finally get into the hemocele to where for it to work, okay? Now, think about it. Bed bugs usually use a lot of products that are direct application or you, and you, have, you embrace the, the surface of the insect for that particular product to get into its uh, needed area. Then or you might have to have something that the insect might need to ingest, say like borates, for example, or particular um, active ingredients in baits like hydromethylon, all right? And then you might have something that can just pass through the trachea, which is the opening of the of the, uh, the whole, its openings of the insects that allow them to breathe, and it diffuses in through there into the hemocele. We have, say, maybe a contact insecticide like, like uh, um, Tall Star or Demand CS, okay? So, generally speaking, majority of times when you're controlling insects and you're using uh, material, you're probably trying, you're probably spraying on top of the insect and you're going through the going through the cuticle and going in through the trachea, okay? And this is a, say this is a um, longitudinal view. All these openings right here are trachea and they have tubes that go into it, go from there into the muscle tissue of the insect and it vaginates into the muscle tissue of the insect and that's where your insecticide actually leads into. Now, um, this is a praying mantis and as you can see, these sort of slits and its body are where the, the spiracles originate. So if you're trying to control something like this, you spray this insect and the material goes in, in the slits, okay? Now the cellular defense that an insect has is that it actually has, hem it has cells that in their hemolymph that will actually attack a foreign object and actually encapsulate it and then consume it itself. Also, the hemolymph can kind of harden in and of itself, it'll coagulate like our blood does, and then it'll attack a foreign object and kind of harden, and then you have the hemocytes that will eat that foreign material, okay? Third, though, I think what's most important is the receptor site of what your insecticide is trying to find. That is that <clears throat> if you sh when you treat a particular pest with product A, that product A has a square peg, and that square peg is trying to find a square hole. And sometimes what happens is the insect evolves and that square hole turns around and then it just doesn't work, 
Okay, and this can happen either through behavior, as I said, or just pure cellular defense and adaptation. All right, but if you think about resistance, the big, we'll go back to where flies in general, it's really the house fly. And it started probably in 1947, 19, 1950s, where the homeowner sort of had this recurring population of house flies over and over and over and over again, okay? So a new insecticide would be introduced um, between two and 20 years after their introduction for another one to come across. So you'd have to sort of say, okay, I use insecticide A, and then two or three years later, they need insecticide B, and then insecticide C, and so forth and so forth. The problem is they're all in the same family, most likely, at first. All we had was like carbamates and organophosphates at the very beginning until we started getting into the synthetic pyrethroids. But this phenomenon is called the pesticide treadmill, okay? And so if you think about it, the treadmill is that the speed in which a resistance develops depends on several factors. How fast the insect reproduces, the mitigation, that is that, uh, and the host range of that insect itself, okay? And then some insects are more susceptible to insecticide applications than others, and then there's some individuals within that population that became, become more susceptible. Bed bugs are a great example. Bed bugs hide in the smallest cracks and crevices. So if you have a room and you're trying to spray for bed bugs and you do it wrong, and you don't get in those small cracks and crevices, you're going to have a complete failure and you're gonna have a callback, and that's quote unquote, I consider some ways resistance because you're not applying the proper technique to the pest population to try to control. Now, uh, we think about crop protection, but crop and insects is the same thing. And I think I consider the crop in our, in our industry as the house or the, or the, or the, um, or the commercial kitchen, okay? Uh, now, resistance increases fastest in situations in small environments. I say greenhouses and things like that, but if you think about it, if you have a, an area um, that's cluttered, for example, if you're trying to do bed bug work, and the homeowner is not helping you clean up or she, they haven't prepped the room for control for you to apply, then you're gonna have a problem controlling that bed bug population, okay? And so if you think about it, how, how in terms of residential applications, commercial applications, are they the same? They very much are the same. That is that you can take that and go now to, for example, a commercial kitchen. If that commercial kitchen does not have a sanitation program, you can spray liquid insecticides all day long or try to treat all day long, you're not gonna control that fly issue, okay? Now, so as you keep on applying these continued applications, this leads to more frequent applications and more frequent applications of the same insecticide. So you're using a synthetic pyrethroid and you go back and you spray once a month, then you find out you have to spray once every three weeks, and then you have to spray once every two weeks, and then you spray once a week, okay, what's the issue? Why is, why, you, why is your pattern increasing through time, okay? This is because usually what happens is, is that as you see resistance, you think that your same product that you're using or your same process is gonna work, and it really doesn't. And so what happens is that you, you, you don't necessarily see it, but you're on the treadmill. And I think the treadmill is that sometimes you're like, you're, you're, you know, think of a treadmill and you keep on running and running and running on that treadmill, but you don't go any farther. You're staying there, but you're running faster and faster and faster, thinking that you're gonna get to the end of a, of a particular length of distance and you don't, you don't reach that particular point. So some species are more prone and some species, some individuals of species are more prone. And so this can change the way your treadmill works and it will change your your ability to treat the pest population and it will affect what type of chemistry that you decide to use for the future. So this is what I call the treadmill. So no what I say is that no matter how much you try to run in this treadmill, if your diet consists of fast food consistently, it's probably not gonna make a difference how much you work out, all right? But if you're lean and mean and you, just, and you change your diet, you can be the yoga master, all right? It's all about what you eat. So you, so think about that. You know, you, 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 if, you, if you don't, if you keep on eating the same stuff and you're working out and it's not, it's not doing you any good, you need to change, okay? All right, so what is IRAC? Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. It's an organization that is focused on reducing the amount of resistant based on the insecticide family that you use to control a particular pest population. And these families will exhibit differences based on the species, the behavior, as I said before, and then of course the stewardship, that is that what, 
how, how are you supposed to actually use this product in an efficacious way without violating the label or, or using too much or applying too much. All right. Uh, it prolongs the effectiveness, basically, of this particular insecticide. And so the, it, it allows for insecticide resistance management strategies. That is that these strategies are kind of focused on particular insect pests that will allow you and give you guidance in terms of choosing what particular insecticide family to use at what particular point. So you might use family A and then the next, app, the next time you apply, you use family B, then you use family C, and you go back to family A. And I'll show you that to you in a minute here, okay? But it's all about stewardship too. That is that um, stewardship uh, is very important because that's about you, the operator, and how you apply the product and how you use the product. And if you use it wisely and environmentally sound, that is that you don't use too much, you don't apply it too much, yeah, and you apply it in the right areas as well, okay? So it's, defend, it's, it's basically I, the Insecticide Resistance Action, Action Committee is the global authority on insecticides and they focus all these insecticides on different families based on their mode of action. That is their target site that they actually have to, the chemistry has to reach to, to kill the particular insect pest. All right. This is the general mode classification. You can get this poster. It's a nice size poster. They'll send it to you for free. All right. But these are all the different insect families that are listed based on their modes of action and their target receptor sites that they actually um, attack. Generally, we'll talk about the tobacco hornworm and the tobacco budworm, okay? So caterpillars obviously are, can be a worldwide pest in terms of crop. But if you look at right here, the effective IPM strategies, mode of action W, mode of action X, mode of action Y, mode of action Z, back to mode of action W, all right? So it's allowing you the sequence of insecticides through the season i.e. families that you use to reduce the population with minimal resistance possible, okay? And so these are all of the areas that you can think about. Here's, here's the muscle and target insecticides. They, use, they attack muscles and nerves. Insecticides that actually work for uh, the midgut. You have growth regulators and you have respiration uh, inhibitors, okay? And so W, X, Y, and Z are used in this sort of sequence to reduce the pest population, right? Now, if you keep on going on and if you, if, you, if you peruse the website well enough, you'll find it for aphids and white flies. Some of you might want to might do a lot of landscape work and treat for aphids or white flies and gardenias and things like that. But they also sort of have the same exact uh, characteristic where you have a sequence of insecticides through the season, all right? So then you talk about, for example, mosquitoes. All right, mosquitoes as well. And if you think about this, they give you ex um, written examples in terms of what the growth and development targets are for this particular pest. Uh, and then as you, this kind of website started with just ag, but now it's gotten along to where it's, it's focused on a lot of other insect pests that are in our, in our um, industry. So we'll start with house flies, okay? Then you, you look at cockroaches. So, and you also have, it'll give you public health important uh, um, descriptions, management resistance, and it sort of gives you a diagram of what all these sort of insecticides can do to reduce that pest population, okay? And then it gives you also some uh, references for re reading material as well. Bed bugs, this is a great source for bed bugs. If you're having a problem with bed bugs, I highly recommend that you reference the IRAC for their for their guidance and their reading materials in terms of resistance management and tools for bed bug populations, okay? So, what are the type of mode of actions, uh, i.e. families, so to speak? So you have nerve and muscle, growth, respiration, mid-gut, and you have some sort of non-specific ones. All animals kind of share similarities. And through the history of insecticide development, you'd have generalist insecticides, the carbamates and organophosphates, that would kill anything, and they've, been able through technology, technology to make them more harmonized for the insect population and not a generalist for um, other animals as well. The majority of what we use are nerve and muscle. Okay, the majority of our industry and agriculture are mainly nerve and muscle, and then probably next would be growth inhibitors. 
all right? And then maybe a little respiration, and, and then the mid-guts uh, used for wood preservation, for borates and stuff like that. A lot of times mid-guts are very um, specific, and, the, and also for multi-site, non-specific um, insecticides as well. So we'll start with the nerve and muscles. These are uh, ones that kind of mess with the neural pathway. And so usually the insecticide has to get through the barrier of the insect, whether it's through the trachea or whatnot, abrasions, and get to the nerve, the nerve endings. So acetylcholine, the esterase, uh, is a compound that when nerve endings fire and communicate, they have to be cleaned off. And so the acetylcholine esterase cleans the nerve endings. And, the major and so a lot of these actually, these inhibitors, prevent that from happening. So it clogs up. It's like, say, for example, you don't, you know, your, your oil in your car starts to kind of get old and after, you should change it to 5,000 miles, but you wait 15,000 miles, all of a sudden there's issues, right? This is what happens and sort of, it, it, it prevents the, the nerve endings from being cleaned and, and, and firing properly, all right? Organophosphates and carbam carbamates. The only one probably in our industry that's still used would probably be either acephate or propoxer, okay, which are both usually in aerosols only. Then you have what's called the sodium ion channels, and these are the ones we use the most. And so what happens is that after uh, nerve ending is cleaned, it's gotta be charged as well. And so this prevents the charging process from happening, so it doesn't fire correctly as well. It's a variance on the theme, and it acts a little bit differently, but it, and it has a different target site, but it affects the nerve ending just slightly amount to where it reduces resistance a little bit less, or prevents resistance a little bit um, less, or more, you should say. So the pyrethroids and pyrethrins, very common, right? So if you look at all these, bifenthrin, cyflutherin, cypromethrin, deltamethrin, they're all used in our industry. Obviously, DDT is the old stuff, and this sort of, be, these evolved from DDT, okay? Then you have, instead of uh, preventing something from firing you, uh, or changing the ion in the, in the nerve site, you actually sort of overstimulate it. And so now it's starting to pump more than it should. So maybe the nerve ending you know, shoots 5,000 times every second or whatever. Now it's shooting like 25,000 times a second. So it's confusing the, the, the insect and the muscle tissue. All right. Well, we have you have chloridane, obviously, which is well known, but in our industry is fipronil. So if you look at, if you remember the poster I showed you earlier, these are all in the same family. And it's just a tweak in their chemical structure that allows them to react differently to the insect. All right, so <clears throat> let's talk about the neonicotinoids. Now, neonics are an evolving family that started with uh, a metacloprid for the most part. And actually is the most widely used insecticide in the world. It's not only a, you can spray the insect with it, but it really has to be ingested. But it's also, um, it has the proper, uh, proper properties of actually being systemic in a plant. So you can kind of, you'll find even over the, a lot of over the counter uh, fertilizers will have a little bit of metacloprid that you can fertilize your plants with and so forth and that metacloprid will kind of systemically flow through the plant and then when an insect, a frog, hopper, or uh, an aphid penetrates the, the tissue, it eats that material, okay? Now, it are, they are based on nicotine. I mean, if you think about nicotine, think about smoking, whether cigarettes or cigars or dip tobacco, it fires you up gets you all sort of brave and so forth. And this is what this does. This really hammers the insect in terms of excitability. So what's great about the neonics is that they're not a generalist. That is that they're very, their pathway is very much more uh, targeted for the insect. And so it, it, you can kind of have contact with some of these insecticides and not necessarily feel affected by them because we don't have the target sites for them to work, okay? But nicotine is one of the, the baselines, and you know, obviously that, that nicotine was sometimes used in third world countries still. Uh, but if you think of, if you look at he, these right here, you have metacloprid, obviously, uh, acetamiprid, thymothoxin. So this is thymothoxin in some baits, acetamiprid is, is in some liquid insecticides as well, sometimes combined 
with synthetic pyrethroids. Think about that now. Now you have two families, right? So you have two modes of action on the insect, which helps reduce resistance even more. Okay. And then it's close cousin, the spinosins. Now, spinosins are, are they get it from a bacteria, or the, the, the active ingredient, but usually you find this in a bait. And this is something that's interesting is that some of these families have to be made into baits, that they generally work well when they're completely ingested as compared to say, for example, a minocloprid as a liquid spray that you can spray on the insect, it might be able to penetrate the insect well enough to where it gets to the target site, but some, Neonix and his close cousins have to be ingested for it to actually work and get into the target, get to the target receptor. Okay, and spinosin, spinosid, and so forth. These are these are uh, very hot materials in terms of efficacy and are found in a lot of baits, usually like ant baits, maybe some fire ant baits, cricket baits, things like that. Okay. <clears throat> then of course you have abamectin. So abamectin is from a bacteria. And, uh, uh, you know, and usually you find it in, say, for example, dry flowable cockroach baits and things like that. It, it needs to be somewhat ingested as well. You can have it as in a liquid form, but in our industry, I think it's because of its sensitivity in the environment in terms of it breaks down fairly quickly, I believe, you have to have it in the bait form so it stays in the bait. And once the insect consumes it, then it starts to work and finds the target site. All right, growth regulators. I would say this is probably number two in terms of mode of action and what we use. I always recommend if you're doing fly work in commercial kitchens to always use an insect growth regulator. Um, and of course, if you have a lot of termite contracts and you use termite baits and so forth like that, they have insect growth regulators in them that prevents the, the larva from molting. But there's many, there's several different kinds and I, Mainly what they do is they prevent metamorphosis, okay? And so regardless if it's a, a semi-metabolous or holometabolous insect, there's hormones in these insects that actually fluctuate during, uh, and the amounts of their fluctuation trigger certain responses in the insect chemistry. And so it will either shed its skin and kind of grow bigger or actually molt in of itself and change form into something else, right? So think of a caterpillar that pupates and then becomes a butterfly. Well, these juvenile hormone mimics, what happens is you tweak the level so high or prevent it from happening and they become uh, deformed when they try to molt, all right? So methylprene is probably one of the more, more common ones uh, that we use for fleas and that's a baseline juvenile hormone uh, analog. But then the more advanced ones would probably be like pyrofoproxin, um, pyro, pyroproxifen, that is for ants and crickets and fleas, so you have a, and flies and so forth. So you have a large list of insects that this product actually works on. And these are also are good to use with other insecticides. So you can mix it with a synthetic pyrethroid or a neonic and sort of, you, as again, you have two modes of action attacking the insect, which reduces the chance for resistance. Okay. Then you have what's called the chitin inhibitors. Now, these are used for baits like in termites, and sometimes you can find them in ant baits too, but mainly it's for termites. And obviously we know dibufenzaron and hexaflumeron, which are common in some of the, the termite baits that are used in our industry. And what this does is that the insect itself, so the, the, as, the, as, the, as the insect sort of consumes the material, and it tries to molt to a bigger size, it just doesn't, it just can't, and it becomes deformed, all right? So they all sort of work in tandem with each other, so to speak, the, the juvenile hormone mimics and the, the chitin inhibitors, all right? Now respiration, respiration is interesting because this is usually always an abate, and we will think of like, say for example, hydromethanon, but what it does is it's not respiration in the sense of that the insect can't breathe, it's the cellular, the ATP in the cells and the mitochondria, what we all have actually. So for example, cyanide is a classic example of a, um, of a respiration um, inhibitor. And so the insect suffocates, so to speak, and then because of that, it also sort of 
messes up with its neural net. For some reason, it also has sort of a neural network issue as well after it comes across some of these uh, respirating uh, insecticides that, pre excuse me, that prevent respiration. Hydromethanone is the most common one, obviously. Ants, and now it's kind of used in what we call complete baits. So there's a product um, that's out there, that, or one or two, that actually are labeled for crickets, ants, uh, occasional invaders, and it has hydromethanol as the active ingredient. I like the hydromethanol sort of complex three uh, transport inhibitors because there's, not, there's zero, res lot of, not much resistance when it comes to this particular product, this particular active ingredient. And you'll find, for example, cyanide is the same thing. There's not much resistance in cyanide. It's nature's poison, so to speak, okay? Um, cyanides were used a long time ago, obviously, for killing rats. Um, probably the most, you know, the most common rat bait, I forgot the time what it was called, but it was, you know, they, they put like putty with meat and jelly and stuff and put a little cyanide powder in there, potassium cyanide, and the rat would eat it and be dead in about 10 minutes, right? We can't do that now, but <laughs> it's nature. All right, so little, little chance of resistance when you use uh, respiration inhibitors. Now the midgut, this is something, these are, these, these are uh, uh, insecticides that focus on the midgut itself. Generally they have to be consumed, but they could pass through the spiracles if, if, it's, if, the, if, the, if the material that is carrying these active ingredients is, is uh, developed properly. Generally speaking, though, it's all about uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, the BT variances, and so not very common in our industry, but actually you can get the products that have the toxins, it's just that they're very expensive because they have to, to, to make, make this material, they have to grow bacteria in large vats, like in beer vats, and then they raise the toxin level and they kill all the bacteria, and so you just have this dead bacteria with all the live toxin, and that's what you're that's what you're using. So it's very expensive. I think a gallon of material is like three hundred dollars sometimes, two hundred hundred dollars. Okay, but very effective. And then you have the non-specific uh, multi-site insecticides. Um, borates are a prime example of this. Now. These also actually have a low chance for resistance. That is that in my history with uh, product development formulation work, what you, you'll see what's called the moribund effect. That is that you'll have an insecticide that's sprayed on insect directly or it's on a, a surface and you're, you're, you're testing for residual efficacy and the insect will kind of look dead after a day or two and then it sort of comes back to life, so to speak. So a lot of times when you get the reports back from third-party labs, when you're doing efficacy work, you'll see sort of like a um, um, percentage of death as the days go on, and then it might drop down a little bit and kick back up, okay? And so with borates, though, that's not the case. That is that once, once the insect eats enough of the material, then there is no resistance, it's game over. All right, and borates also kind of work in such a way that um, they are sort of a inhibitor of, or say they were repellent, so to speak. They inhibit sometimes beetles from laying eggs on the wood, things like that. So it's it's another nature's poison. Very very close cousin is methyl bromide, right? So you think about methyl bromide, and what we use it, methyl bromide for is for fumigation and so forth, and 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 other fumigants, they, were very, they work very well with borates. And so sometimes you can use these two chemistries in conjunction if you're trying to, if you have, say, a particular situation where the, the whole house is just infested with, with beetles or termites and, and there's no way you can really spot treat, you have to do a whole house treatment. You could do a fumigant treatment and either apply borates before or afterwards that treatment to, to prevent the pest population from returning, okay? And then you have a bunch of unknowns, and I, 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 like, I like lime, sulfur, and sulfur. I tried to use these chemistries when I was in grad school to prevent ticks. And I can tell you it really doesn't work that good. <laughs> so uh, if you want to prevent ticks from getting on you, just through my experience when I was a grad student, I had to do a lot of survey work. 
the best thing to do is just wear shorts and put off and all on your skin and just wear off. And that's the best method, trust me. All right? I used to strap my legs down and use salt for getting them to work. But they don't really know how these sort of all these chemicals sort of act on the insect. They just uncertain, but I guess it, it tweaks something wrong with them and they just end up dying. So I, I really couldn't tell you what they are. These are hence the, hence the unknown mode of action. All right? Now, let me summarize this, that is that when you think about the treatment that you're using and your treatment's not working, as I said before, many times what happens is that the technician thinks that the product they're using is not working and I need to have a different product. And what happens is you go, okay, well then we'll just give you, if you're using a bifenthrin, then you can use cyclutrin. Well, remember those are, they're in the, those are in the same family, those are sodium ion uh, regulators. So, why would you switch from one product to the next if it's in the same family, particularly maybe it's the same formulation, okay? So remember that it's not necessarily the chemical that is the issue, but potentially how you are applying that product, as in say the time of day or the time of year, things like that can influence that product's performance on that pest population, all right? So if you, if you think about it and you do a tactical application, that is that how do I increase my chance for success based on the given tools that I have? Well, obviously you just don't spray everywhere and everything because that's not gonna help you in the commercial kitchen if the kitchen management system doesn't have a sanitation program to work with you, right? If you don't clean those drains, if you don't find where the larvae are breeding, you can, spray and set aside all day long for the adults, but the, but those larvae, will, some adults will not die and they'll breed in the same locations and you'll still have this recurring population. And that's what a lot of times I see in commercial kitchen work when, when you have, I've done some consulting for um, some pest control operators that have done some accounts and there's a problem account and what's the issue? Well, it's like, you gotta get on your hands and knees a lot of times, all right, to find out what that issue is and just by spraying, uh, Bifenthrin and cyclutherin and cyclomethrin or delta methrin, it's not going to work unless you tweak your application process and tweak why you're using that particular product and where you're, where you're, where you're actually applying it. Yeah. Okay, so understand the parameters of time and space and use patterns based on the insect species. Okay, another example would be ants. Um, I think there's a common mistake where you disrupt, some people are trying to disrupt the foraging trail of an ant species. You don't want to do that. They're predators, many of the ones we work with for the most part. And when you let them find the bait, and also apply the bait maybe at particular times of the day. For example, fire ants are usually more active in early morning at night. So if you're in Arizona and it's 115 degrees outside and you, and you apply a fire ant bait and you let it soak out in the sun for four or five hours, all that oil might disintegrate or you know, evaporate out and that bait becomes less attractive. So it'd probably be ideal to apply it at first thing in the morning or maybe even at night, so to speak, where the ants are out foraging and it's not as, you know, it's not as hot. As we, know, as we all know, um, Arizona, a lot of the insect life is nocturnal, right? And on top of that, Arizona actually, actually has, the largest ant, has the largest ant diversity in the country. So you have a lot of ants in Arizona. Uh, and so understand the parameters of time and so forth that and the function of the insecticide. What's that, what's that insecticide made to do? What's the focus of that insecticide? Now and then I do get calls about our boar care and can it be applied to soil? No, it's not a soil termitocide. It will fail miserably, all right? So use that as an example as well, okay? So all of these, how to be more tactical, allow you to higher chance for success, less callbacks, obviously less resistance, okay? And you have a duty to your customers as well. Keep up with the trends, extend your knowledge, learn, just you know, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee website has reading material that you can reference that will help you learn about management strategies for particular pests. So if you're deciding to get into bed bug work, I strongly recommend that you, that you reference their website and, and see what, what they have. And, it, and it, 
their website actually evolves over time too. So keep in mind, they all, it's constantly changing and they always have new material on their website, right? Those pictures I sent you that I showed you are probably, I don't know, a couple years old actually, all right? So that's about it. Thank you for attending and if you have any questions, give me a call, all right?